Hey, what's up everybody? And welcome back to another section in this algorithmic patterns course. In this section, we're going to focus on dynamic programming, which is known to be pretty difficult to wrap your head around, but I promise that if you stick with me, you'll see that this pattern is very manageable if you start with simpler problems and progressively move towards solving more difficult problems. To introduce this pattern, we're going to start with the very famous Fibonacci sequence. Now Fibonacci in a nutshell is basically a sequence such that each number in the sequence is the sum of the two numbers that precede it. I have a very short video on the Fibonacci sequence that I will link above. If you're unfamiliar with the Fibonacci sequence and its application in code, I suggest that you take 5 minutes to go and watch this video prior to continuing with this section of the course. So what is dynamic programming? We're going to break dynamic programming down into its defining components in an effort to truly understand what dynamic programming is. We're going to start by first identifying the two key attributes that a problem must have in order for dynamic programming to be applicable, those two attributes being an optimal substructure and overlapping subproblems. When these two attributes are present, a problem can be solved with a naive recursive solution. So even though it's implied that a problem with these two attributes can be solved with a recursive algorithm, for clarity, we will just add a recursive solution as a third attribute that a problem must have in order for dynamic programming to be applicable. We'll go over these three attributes using Fibonacci as our example, so please make sure that you watch the video on the Fibonacci sequence that I linked before if you don't already have an understanding. Once we know how to identify problems where dynamic programming can be applied, we will then go over why optimizing these problems by making use of dynamic programming is necessary. That is, problems that have the before mentioned attributes have something in common. Throughout this explanation, you will learn what that is, so just hang in there. After going over why optimizing these problems using dynamic programming is necessary, we'll finally get into how to make use of dynamic programming to optimize these problems using two approaches. A top-down approach, also known as memoization, and a bottom-up approach, also known as tabulation. So to start, a general definition of dynamic programming. You won't fully understand the meaning of this definition until the end of the video, but this will give us a base to build upon. Dynamic programming in layman's terms is efficiently solving a big problem by breaking it down into smaller problems and reusing the solutions to the smaller problems that come up again so that we don't need to solve those smaller problems more than once. So just keep that in the back of your mind throughout the rest of this explanation and don't worry if you don't fully understand it just yet. Now, let's start with the identifying attributes of a problem that can be solved using dynamic programming. We'll start with the meaning of optimal substructure. A problem is said to have an optimal substructure if the solution to the overall problem can be constructed from the solutions to its subproblems. Let's take the Fibonacci sequence as an example. If we want to know the fifth Fibonacci number, we need to add together the third and the fourth Fibonacci numbers. And to get the fourth Fibonacci number, we need to add together the second and third Fibonacci numbers. And this continues all the way down to the zeroth and first Fibonacci numbers, which are always zero and one respectively. As you can see, the solution to the overall problem, which is figuring out what the fifth Fibonacci number is, is constructed from the solutions of its subproblems. And this is what is meant by optimal substructure. Because remember, a problem is said to have an optimal substructure if the solution to the overall problem can be constructed from the solutions to its subproblems. The solution to Fibonacci 5 is constructed from the solution to Fibonacci 3 and 4, and the solutions to Fibonacci 3 and 4 are constructed from their two preceding subproblems respectively as well. So let's have a look at how this actually looks in code. Here we have a naive recursive solution to finding the nth Fibonacci number. So in this first conditional, if n is less than 2, we just return n. And that's because in this case, the two numbers less than 2 are 1 and 0. And remember that Fibonacci 0 is always 0, so we can just return n if it is 0. And Fibonacci 1 is always 1, so we can just return n if n is 1. Moving on. In this else block, you see that this recursive solution is taking advantage of the fact that this problem has an optimal substructure. 
That is, the solution to n here is being constructed by calling this same function on its subproblems here, in a depth first manner, which can be visualized like so. So here is our problem, get the nth Fibonacci number, and here are its subproblems. These subproblems all come together to construct the solution to the original problem or the top level problem. Now it's important to note that this solution to retrieving the nth Fibonacci number is not making use of dynamic programming yet. This is just a naive recursive solution. But we can see in this solution that this problem does in fact have one of the attributes necessary for dynamic programming to be applicable, an optimal substructure. Now let's go over the meaning of overlapping subproblems. Now for this problem in particular, the overlapping subproblems attribute is quite intuitive to identify if you already have an understanding of what it means for a problem to have an optimal substructure. And for this very reason, we went over optimal substructure first. Now remember those subproblems that we talked about when going over the definition to optimal substructure? Yeah, the ones that can be used to construct the solution to the problem as a whole? Those are the same subproblems that we are referring to when we talk about the attribute of overlapping subproblems. Let me show you what I mean. Now in this tree, you can see all of the subproblems that come together to construct the solution for the fifth Fibonacci number. Each subproblem is a recursive call to the fib function. Now you've probably already noticed that some of these subproblems are being solved more than once. For example, the subproblem that gets the second Fibonacci number is being solved here here, and here. And the subproblem that gets the third Fibonacci number is being solved here and here. These are overlapping subproblems. They are subproblems that are being solved more than once. In other words, they are overlapping. So that means that this problem has the second attribute necessary for dynamic programming to be applicable, overlapping subproblems. Now, if a problem has these two characteristics, it can, by the very definition of these two characteristics, be solved using recursion. This is why when trying to identify if a problem is a dynamic programming problem, whether or not the problem can be solved using a recursive solution is a good hint. But this doesn't mean that all problems with recursive solutions can be optimized with dynamic programming. This is why you must understand the two attributes that we just discussed, optimal substructure and overlapping subproblems. So now that we've learned how to identify problems where dynamic programming can be applied, let's now go over why optimizing these problems using dynamic programming is necessary. For the most part, you've already seen why optimizing solutions using dynamic programming is beneficial during the explanation of overlapping subproblems. Let's once again go back to our recursive Fibonacci tree. First of all, these overlapping subproblems are taking up time and resources. This results in the time complexity of our naive recursive solution being exponential. This is because at every level of the tree, the number of subproblems grows exponentially. And if you're in need of a deeper explanation of what I mean by that, please watch this video linked above that explains the time complexity of the recursive Fibonacci function in detail. Anyways, it's obvious that resolving the issue of overlapping subproblems will make our solution more efficient. And we can resolve this issue by using dynamic programming to ensure that we never solve subproblems more than once. So remember that general definition of dynamic programming that I gave you earlier? The one that talks about reusing the solutions to smaller problems that come up again so that we don't need to solve those smaller problems more than once? Well, here's where you start to realize that definition. We need a way to cache the results of our subproblems so that we don't solve subproblems more than once. And this very caching of subproblem solutions to be reused later to avoid overlapping subproblems is a key component in dynamic programming. So there are two approaches to implementing this. One is a top-down approach, also known as memoization, and the other is a bottom-up approach, also known as tabulation. Let's start with the top-down or memoization approach. Now, in our original problem, we're already using recursion to solve it, and we are already solving it from the top down. Let me explain what I mean by that. So recall that to solve some Fibonacci number n, we need to know the two Fibonacci numbers that precede it. And this requirement is recursive. That is, this will be true for every preceding Fibonacci number and its preceding numbers, all the way down to the base cases, which are Fib0 and Fib1, which equals 0 and 1, respectively. 
So if we look at our tree, we're starting from the top here where we call the fib function on five and recursing down the tree structure in a depth first manner until we reach the base cases of fib zero and fib one. And at that point, we're adding together the returns for all of the subproblems up until we reach the initial call with the solution to fib five. So we have the top down part of the approach covered, but this is still just a naive recursive solution and does not yet make use of dynamic programming because it is not yet optimized to avoid overlapping subproblems. Now, people oftentimes use the terms memoization and top down approach and dynamic programming interchangeably, but in my opinion, it is better to separate all of these in your mind because intuitively this naive recursive solution is still a top-down approach even though it isn't making use of dynamic programming. And all dynamic programming solutions don't use memoization. So it's probably better to think of this as being approach one. And from there we can say that approach one uses a top-down approach which is recursion and then memoization which is the caching of solutions to overlapping subproblems. So for the sake of clarity, let's just say that this is approach one and for approach one to be considered a dynamic programming approach, we need both top-down and memoization. So as mentioned before, top-down is covered. Now for memoization. Memoization is simply caching solutions to subproblems so that we don't end up with any overlapping subproblems. So that means that we can adjust our solution to store the results to all of our subproblems before returning them. Here's what the code for that would look like. Now, as you can see, we are now adding a default empty dictionary parameter to our fib function, which we check prior to solving a subproblem to see if we have already solved this subproblem. If we haven't already solved this subproblem, we solve it and add its solution to our memo dictionary, which is acting as our cache, and then return the value that we just added to the cache. Just looking at the code, it's probably difficult to see what is happening here. So let's once again, visualize this using a tree structure. So when this line of code is executed, this left call to the fib function is actually returned prior to this right call ever being made. So the tree actually progresses like so. And remember, in recursion, values are returned in a depth first manner. That is, this bottom most left call, where we reach the base case of one returns first, and then this bottom most right call where we reach the base case of zero returns second. And those are added together to give us the result of fib two. At that point, fib2 is memoized prior to being returned, and then within this fib3 call, this fib1 base case is returned and is added to the fib2 call, which is first memoized and then returned by the fib3 call. And then within this fib4 call, we need to know the answer to fib2. But we've already solved fib2 here and memoized it, so in this call to fib2, we're just going to return the cached value for fib2 so we don't recurse down any further here. So that fib2 result is added to the fib3 result, which is also memoized and returned by the fib4 call. Finally, back at our initial call for fib5, we then make the right call to fib3, but we already solved fib3 here. So we don't need to recurse down this right tree. We just return the cache result for fib3. And we now have our dynamic programming solution for finding the nth Fibonacci number, which uses a top-down memoization approach. And as you can already see in this tree diagram, we are drastically decreasing the number of calls to the fib function that we need to make. This decreases the time complexity from exponential to O of n. Now let's get into the bottom up slash tabulation approach. For this approach, since we know the base values to the sequence, that is, we know that fib zero is zero and fib one is one, we can build our solution up from there in an iterative way until we reach the Fibonacci number that we want to get. So instead of starting from the top and recursing down, we'll start with our base cases, which are fib zero and fib one, add them together, and now we have fib two. And we can add fib one and fib two together, and now we have fib three. And this is the bottom up approach because we are starting from our bottom or our base cases, building up from there. And this approach we'll just think of as the second approach, which is a bottom up approach that uses tabulation. So now let's try to get an understanding of tabulation. So I personally like to think of tabulation in terms of something like a spreadsheet. So here I have this spreadsheet which has the Fibonacci sequence up until Fib22. And when looking at this table, we can just think of these row numbers here as our tabs, and the Fibonacci numbers that correspond to each tab are in column A. 
Now with this visualization of tabulation, you probably have already come to understand this intuitively as being similar to an array data structure. So to tabulate our Fibonacci numbers from the bottom up, we can store each result in an array. And of course, initially we can just set the first and second values in our array or the zeroth and first indexes of our array to zero and one as our base cases. And then we can just build up from there. And this is what it's going to look like in code. So we're just returning in if n is zero or one, same as last time. And then we're creating an array of size n plus one because we're starting from zero. And then for the first two indexes of the array, we are setting the base values, which are fib zero and fib one. And from these base cases, we're going to iterate up until n and from the bottom up, build to the nth Fibonacci number. So as you can see, we start from index two because we're skipping our two base cases. And at each iteration building up to n, we're going to set that Fibonacci number's value to the sum of its two preceding values. And the same as in our top-down solution, you can see where we have an optimal substructure here, because we're doing the same thing for every index or Fibonacci number. And each of these subproblems are going to come together to compose our overall solution. And since this is in fact a dynamic programming solution, you can see that we don't have the issue of overlapping subproblems either we're only solving each subproblem once. And there's actually a way that we can optimize this algorithm to use constant space instead of O of N space, but I have faith that you guys can figure that out on your own, so I will not go over that here. So anyways, that is dynamic programming. In following videos, we're going to solve some dynamic programming leak code problems to solidify what we've learned. If this was helpful to you, please hit the like button and I will see you in the next one.